Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm here uh, not only to impart some wisdom on you about uh, magnetic fields that are created by charges that move, but I'm also here to, uh, you know, spook you out in the camera. Uh, you know, okay, just, all right, that's fun. All right, so um, this is a PowerPoint from an old textbook. Um, the PowerPoint itself is, once again, in the website. Um, it is available to you. I have taken some slides out in order to shorten this down, just FYI. So um, let's go ahead and get started, shall we? Okay, so the big idea we want to get across here is the last time I gave you guys a video, we talked about how uh, charges that move in a magnetic field, they give you um, a magnetic force that you know pushes the charge, but no work gets done. Um, but that was for charges that moved in a magnetic field. What's important for us to get down now is that charges that move create their own magnetic field. So if you have a charge moving through uh, open space, it will create its own magnetic field around it that is perpendicular both to uh, the electric field and to the movement of the charge. Okay, and so that often ends up being a radial thing. And uh, there'll be some pictures in here that you can see to show it. But um, the important thing, again, is that when a charge moves through open space, it will create its own magnetic field as well. Um, now, you get a bunch of those charges moving together. We call that current. So current uh, being carried through a wire will create a magnetic field around the wire. Uh, so it's important to remember that. Um, and then when you get a couple of wires next to each other, they'll exert force on each other. But the important thing to remember there is that the magnetic field that is created by one wire can't exert force on itself. So it can exert force on the other wire, but it cannot exert force on itself. Okay, so this is the uh, Law of Biot-Savart, which is um, a French guy. <laughs> okay, uh, so uh, basically if we want to know the magnetic field out at some point P, um, there are charges moving through a wire at any given point and they all are going to contribute some sort of magnetic field depending on their orientation. Now remember, um, the electric field is going to go out radially from a charge, which means that the magnetic field has to be perpendicular or again we're talking here about a cross product so the magnetic field has to be perpendicular both to that radial electric field and the magnetic field has to be perpendicular to the movement so we're really only going to be talking about the um, sign of something since it's a uh, cross product here so each piece of uh, magnetic field that adds up at one point because you know at this point superposition is applied to everything else so let's make it apply to this too right so the magnetic field is going to be the sum of all the different pieces of magnetic field from all the charges moving along a certain segment of wire so the magnetic field is, uh, is gonna have to be summed up at that point, and this is where Biot-Savart comes in. Now, as I told you in the last lecture, um, there are times to use certain rules, right? And so Biot-Savart is very good for two specific situations, and that's a wire of a specific length and a wire that is um, in an arc, and that allows us to uh, take care of this cross product here and that makes everything at 90 degrees and that's fantastic and wonderful now the important thing to note is there's a couple pieces here that we need to make sure we understand number one mu naught mu naught is the permeability constant for open space so you had epsilon naught for electric field that was permeable through space mu naught is magnetic field uh, and there'll be another slide here in a few seconds that gives it for you but it's basically four pi times 10 to the negative seventh all right, um, now the other one here is ds cross r hat. ds would be the small length of wire that we're taking the current in that's gonna create that magnetic field and then cross r hat. r hat is not an actual thing, it's a vector. So it's just a direction and all that says is cross radially and all that says is that this needs to be 90 degrees to this piece of wire here. That's it. So R hat isn't an actual value. It's not an actual number you're going to get. R hat is just saying, hey, this is going to be radial to this DS piece here that I'm adding up as we go.
Oh, look, it's Munot. Yay. So if you pull out all the stuff that's constant here, um, you're going to get mu naught i and 4 pi that are all constant. Um, and that leaves the integral of ds cross r hat over r squared. Now, r hat, again, is just uh, a direction. And it's just saying this is the piece that is perpendicular. So you could put in sine of theta here. Um, and like I said, bo sub r is most effective when sine of theta ends up just being 1. And so um, you're just going to end up integrating ds over r squared. So you're just doing the integral of basically s over r squared. All right, so this is what I was talking about before. So the electric field from any charge is going to go out in the radial direction, and that means the magnetic field needs to be uh, both perpendicular to ds, that little segment of the wire, uh, and that radial vector r. Uh, and so since we're talking about a third vector, since ds goes, let's say, in the x direction, and r hat goes out in the y direction, that means that we're going to have a particular direction, which you'll see here in just a second, that gives us how everything is going to work out to be around the wire. Okay, so looking at this, the, the thin, uh, long, straight wire here, but of a particular length, so not an infinitely long wire. All right, so uh, BO sub R is really helpful for uh, wires of finite length, of a specific length, and wires that are bent into an arc. Uh, and so looking at the integral that you run there, basically you get um, mu naught I over 4 pi A, and A is the distance you are away from the wire, and then sine uh, from one side to sine of the other side, right? And so if you're taking a point P that is in the middle, you're going to go from sine on one side to sine on the other side, uh, and you're going to get a specific number for that based on your geometry. So after you run the calculus for it, you end up with uh, the magnetic field strength being equal to mu naught times i the current over 2 pi a, a being the distance you are from the wire. Now, um, this is a pretty common one. You don't have to do B O sub r every single time. You can just put this down. Sometimes you'll have to do B O sub r as part of a derivation, so you should know how to run through B O sub r, but this is the formula for the magnetic field near a wire having current passing through it and a distance A away from the wire. So you can just use this. This is the magnetic field strength generated by current running through a wire. So this is the magnetic field around a wire generated by the current running through the wire. Okay, so this is your third right-hand rule. Remember the first two were uh, just the same thing. You could just do it a couple different ways. And remember, right-hand rule always assumes a couple things. Number one, Right-hand rule assumes conventional current, right? So we're assuming everything's positive. And your right-hand rule has index finger for direction of charge movement, and then middle finger for direction of your magnetic field, and then your thumb. Where'd you go? There it is. Okay, and then your thumb is the direction of the force on the charge, and that's from an outside magnetic field. Right, so this, the third right-hand rule is going to give you the direction of the magnetic field that is generated by the charge itself as it moves. So as charges move through a wire, you take your thumb in the direction. Okay, so you take your thumb in the direction of current flowing in the wire, and then your fingers wrap around the wire, and that is the direction of your magnetic field. So your magnetic field runs in circles and radiates out, but it radiates out in circular patterns. All right, so instead of going out straight radially, the magnetic field goes around in a circle. Hooray! All right, now this is the best use of the B.O. Savar law. So if you get uh, at some point P or O or whatever they want to call it, you get this a spot where you want to know what the magnetic field is because of a wire that's nearby and the wire is running at an arc to that point then 
this is your absolute best use of Biosavar law because all of a sudden everything is perpendicular and so you get rid of that sine theta piece and all you need to do is um, mu naught i over 4 pi r in this case r is just a uh, and then theta which is going to be the length of the arc so if you you know if you go for half um, let's see what do we call it like like let's say half of a circle right let's say you're at the very center of a half as a circle right that's going to be pi radian so you just chunk a pi onto the end over there and that's it you're done um, and that's because of the geometry of everything it works out now you might be wondering what about like the wire current from a prime to a or the the segment down on the bottom since that wire is running and would run through that point remember that where is it all right remember that magnetic field goes around the wire right so that magnetic field never actually gets to point zero that magnetic field goes out i don't know if you can see my cursor in this or not but that magnetic field will go out and walk and wrap around the wire perpendicular to the wire from a to a prime so that magnetic field will never pass through point o so you don't have to count it we just leave it alone similarly the magnetic field at the center of a very loop of wire is you know again like i said you just use uh, you chunk on whatever the the angle is in radians right so a circle is two pi radians so you just chunk on two pi at the end there and that cancels out with the four pi uh, and you just end up getting two a at the bottom so mu naught i over two a where a is the distance away from the wire the point is and i is the current in the wire and mu naught is the permeability constant four pi times 10 to the negative seventh so here we have two wires that are running parallel to each other and this is what i was talking about in the very beginning a wire can exert force on another charge because it's going to create a magnetic field and so any other charge moving in that magnetic field will uh, have a force exerted on it however that wire can't be subject to its own magnetic a force by its own magnetic field right so uh, if the two wires are running near each other they're going to create magnetic fields and only the magnetic field from the other wire can create a force on the second wire all right so um, if we have wire one there with a current I going through it right we know that it is going to create a magnetic field that is the strength mu naught I over 2 pi times R or in this case A and so whatever the strength of that magnetic field is A away is uh, where wire 2 is and wire 2 is going to be subject to a force that we know is ILB and so what we have to do is we know that current in wire two is going to be uh, whatever I two is, and it's going to be of length. That wire is going to be of length L, and then the strength of the field from B uh, from the first wire is the force that's going to be exerted on that second wire. So if we take F is equal to I L B, and then we sub in the the findings from bio savar which is mu naught i over 2 pi r then you're going to get this formula here and so the the force on a wire is equal to mu naught i 1 i 2 uh, times l which is the length of the wire that you have in question uh, over 2 pi a and a is the distance away all right and so that that second um I2 times L part is is coming from that first uh, the force on a charge moving through a magnetic field and then the second part the mu naught I over 2 pi A uh, that's coming from the magnetic field being generated by this other wire again a wire cannot generate a magnetic field that then exerts a current on itself or sorry a force on itself but it can exert a force on another wire
All right, so Ampere's law is going to talk about how to uh, do almost the same thing as Biot-Savar, but it has a much more direct application to a infinitely long or whatever you want to consider to be an infinitely long wire. So Biot-Savar is really good when uh, there's an arc of wire that is going to be completely perpendicular to a certain point and you want to get the magnetic field there. Biot-Savar is good for a very short segment of wire, but anything that is any bit longer than that uh, Ampere's law is the way to go. It is much easier. It looks a whole lot like Gauss's law, except it's going to require you to do a little bit of work uh, just conceptually on what you think of as the surface. So again, Ampere's law just basically says here is uh, B dot DS, which has a circular path defined by those compasses. So basically you're following the circular path of the magnetic field here. Uh, and you have the integral of B dot DS. Uh, and the reason there's a little box around the integral is because this is a closed loop integral, which means you have to start at one point and come back and close that loop up at the same exact point where you finish up. Um, now, B dot DS is a closed loop integral, but you're not going to deal with the surface this time. You're going to deal with a circumference. So you're going to be making a circle uh, that goes around the wire that you're talking about. So instead of looking at the wire on the side and looking at that point and adding things up around it like you did with Bio Savar, here you're going to be looking uh, at a cross section of the wire and then you're going to be putting a circle circle around the wire as a cross section of it right so you're looking at the end of the wire and then you're making a circle around it and you're taking the circumference of that circle and that's your closed loop integral is the circumference of that circle right and so there we go technical difficulty there all right so you're taking the circumference around uh, in radius one or in uh, radius two there, which would be inside the wire. So uh, almost like we did with charge distributions and electric fields, with magnetic fields, we can now take the same idea. Um, and what you're gonna find is a very, very familiar uh, result here in just one second. And what we find here is that the integral, the closed loop integral of B dot DS, well, DS is going to be the arc all the way around the wire, which is just 2 pi R, which is equal to mu naught times I. So then B is equal to mu naught I over 2 pi R. So all that complex Bio Savar calculus that you had to do is much, much easier using Ampere's law for an infinitely long wire. You notice there's no, uh, there's no accounting for the length of the wire in this one. You don't have to take into account sine theta one minus sine theta two uh, chunked onto the end of it or anything like that. Um, all we need to do is take that one piece right there. All right, um, so this loop, this Ampereian loop or what sometimes they call Ampereian circle is just this piece around. All right, um, let's stop there for a second and look for the next. And there it is. So this has a very familiar look to it because it's mu naught i over 2 pi r so then basically the magnetic field is um, proportional to 1 over r as it goes out away from the surface of the wire but when you're inside the wire uh, if you run through the calculus uh, b is proportional to r so it's a linear relationship inside as you build up the amount of charge that's moving through the wire and then it is inverse proportional on the way out once you're outside the wire as you get further and further away. All right, now solenoids are interesting. Solenoids are a uh, cylinder shape and they are a series of loops of wires. And now like they show you this solenoid and it's one, two, three, four uh, loops of wire. However, a solenoid would have, a real solenoid would have thousands and thousands of loops of wire, right? And so what you're doing is you're going to get all these loops of wire and they're wrapped really close and tight. And so you notice these little magnetic fields around each other 
and the magnetic field that is extremely close to each wire, each wire has the same amount of current, where each loop has the same amount of current running through it because it's the same wire. And so when you get them close to each other, you notice that the arrows offset each other for the abutting loops. And so you get very close to the wires, you get the magnetic field canceling out because, hey, superposition applies. But then in the center of the solenoid, all of the magnetic fields are matched up and adding up. So even though they're much weaker, because you have thousands and thousands of wraps of wire, all those magnetic fields add up and go in the same direction. So a solenoid creates an extremely strong uh, magnetic field inside and a, a pretty weak one actually on the outside, but an extremely strong one on the inside because of the way uh, the fields superposition right in the center of that cylindrical loop. So because of that and the way the geometries work out, you end up with a north and a south end depending on which way your current is flowing. And this is basically the setup for almost limitless possibilities of applications inside of, of magnetism. But um, because you end up with poles there, remember poles have to be uh, dipoles, right? You always have to have a north and you always have to have a south. So you end up with a dipole right there. You have a north end and a south end, which, like I said, allows you to have uh, a bunch of different applications for use inside of magnetism and electronics. So if you use uh, Ampere's law for a solenoid, you end up getting um, a, a single loop and then you uh, track what's going to happen with that. And then you have to add in as many loops as you have in that. Um, the problem is you also have a length, right? And so you need a, a, a unit strength per length end up is what you're going to end up getting. And so when you finally get what you need, you get mu naught times the current uh, times n, and n is uh, n divided by L. This would be the number of turns per unit length. Um, and so, you know, like maybe you get a thousand turns, that would be a thousand loops, so a thousand turns per meter of a solenoid, that'd be a huge solenoid, but okay. Um, but n is the, the unit number of turns per length, okay? That's a lowercase n. n, uppercase, would be the total turns. All right, now magnetic flux is back. Um, so you thought you were done with flux, but no. Um, now magnetic flux is going to be important in the next part that we do, which is going to be inductance or how we uh, induce current to flow in wire itself. All right, so it's not something you need to do homework right now, but I'll go ahead and just give you the rundown on it. And that is that magnetic flux is the amount of magnetic field that passes through uh, a certain surface just like magnetic flux or sorry electric flux would be the same thing under Gauss's law. Uh, looking at this what you find is that magnetic flux uh, is exactly the same only you have a B instead of an E for the flux part right so that uh, Weber that I showed you guys before the magnetic flux is measured in Weber's Now, the important thing here is once you, uh, once you go through, magnetic flux has to equal zero this time. So instead of magnetic flux equaling something like we had before for electric flux, magnetic flux, because it's a dipole, has to equal zero. So this, the stuff that goes in also has to come back around because north has to connect to south. Um, and basically what this magnetic flux is going to allow us to do is when we measure a change in the magnetic flux, that's gonna drive current. And like I said, that'll be something for next time.